Thank you very much, Eileen. And let me say good evening to everyone who have joined us for our study. It's a joy and it's a pleasure again to be with you, to be able to share the word of the Lord with you as we um, discuss together the word of God in relation to end time events. And we are currently looking at the kingdom of God. Last week, we tried to look at our own interpretations as to answering certain questions that are raised very often in the dialogue in relation to the kingdom of God. So I was just trying to dialogue with you to see where your understanding was in relation to these um, specific questions. And I think we had a, a really very good discussion and we were able to look at some scriptural references which you gave to support your particular view, which we will look at in a little more detail as we um, examine the answers to these questions in relation to what the word of God is indicating. But suffice it to say, you give some very good responses and it seemed that you had a relatively good understanding of things in relation to the kingdom of God. And I think it's important that we, we start there, look at what is your background, what information you have, what is your understanding, then we can build on that and clarify anything that we might need to, to clarify. So we just briefly recap some of these things which we were looking at and then some of the objections um, that were made. And then what we will do is to look at some of the New Testament verses which confirm some of the things that we, we discussed and where you shared your opinion, we will try to get even more confirmation from the word in relation to the answer to some of these things which we were trying to, to get established. One was, is the kingdom of God present, future, or both? We discussed that, meaning it, it, is it a present reality or is it something we have to look for in the future? Or can we establish from the word that the kingdom of God is present in a spiritual sense, but it will have its final consummation in a physical way when Christ returns and establish the eternal kingdom. And we also try to figure out, is it just physical or is there a, a spiritual reality to the kingdom? In other words, is it a place for a specific time and, and establish like regular kingdoms of the world in a physical way? Or is it a spiritual reality that is Christ reigning in the hearts and lives of, of people? Is the kingdom of God within? Is the kingdom of God something that we look forward to the future where Christ will establish a physical kingdom for a thousand years? So in that discussion, I believe we, we did establish from our dialogue and from things that you were able to share, that your understanding was that the kingdom of God is within us. So it's a spiritual experience, which we have when we accept Christ as our savior. It is physical in a, in a sense because Christ is the king. We are the subjects of the kingdom. And he is reading in our hearts. That is the reality of, of where the, the kingdom of God is. And we establish that Christ will return and he will establish his eternal kingdom, which will be made up of all those who have received Christ as their savior. So in a sense, that is looking at it as a physical reality um, still to come in the future because we will not have receive our eternal rewards by being part of the, the kingdom now with Christ reigning in our hearts. So we have some objections to the reality of the kingdom of God being present because the main view of the premillennialists is that the, the kingdom of God has to come in a physical form because Christ has to reign literally on the throne and as a result they are looking for that in a future experience, which will be the millennium, which we will discuss later, because as, as they 
will explain, Christ has not physically reigned while he was on earth. Is what the Jews expected. And I think that that was the error of their expectation, looking for Christ to overthrow the Romans and reign physically as other kings or emperors would have ruled during that time. And I think that the premillennialists, in their view, are falling um, to that same error of, of not understanding the scripture in the sense that Christ is presently reigning in the hearts and lives of, of believers. And that is considered biblically as reigning because that was the expression given um, in the New Testament. And, and so they are looking, like the Jews, for the physical establishment of a kingdom where Christ reigns on a throne. And they are expecting that that will literally take place in Jerusalem in the future. And Christ will reign for a thousand years. That's why it is referred to as the millennium. One objection came from the passage in First Corinthians. They said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. And the argument was that we are still flesh and blood. So we cannot inherit the kingdom. No, it has to be after the resurrection where we are in resurrected bodies. Then we look at the objection from the Lord's Prayer, which says, Thy kingdom come. This was raised by Brother Johnson. And so if Jesus asked disciples to pray that the kingdom will come, it is not then for some interpreters a present reality. And that was their understanding of that. But we concluded that that was, was not the end of, of, the, of the statement. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the reality is that the coming of the kingdom is really in a spiritual sense, people subject to the authority and rule of God and we are subject then to his um, directive as the angelic hosts in heaven are subject to his authority and they obey him in full measure. And that's what Jesus really is asking his disciples to pray for, that we will have that same experience on earth where people will be subject to the authority and rule of Christ. So it is not an indication to say that we are praying for a future kingdom that is not a present reality. Then we look at the verse from Luke, it says, my kingdom is not of this world. And people conclude that that means that the kingdom was not a present reality. That Jesus was saying it was not for that time. And therefore the expectation is then that it will have to be future. We look at that verse in a little more detail and recognize that Jesus was indicating that it is not of the nature of this world in the way that kingdoms are established and the way that kingdoms are managed his is not of that nature but if it were then would his disciples fight to defend him he would establish the physical rule and authority like a lot of kings and emperors did in their time but his kingdom is not of that world so people are not fighting to put Christ on a throne and establish authority in, in that way. Then there was another objection which we didn't mention. This was in Isaiah 9, chapter 6, where it says the government shall be upon his shoulders. And their argument was that literally the government was not on Jesus' shoulders because he did not govern in a physical way. So you see they were looking at this governing, not in a spiritual sense, but as a physical reality. So Jesus did not rule or govern as Isaiah had predicted. So therefore that rule has to be future. And again, they will say that that rule will come in the millennium. And then there were some Old Testament prophecies which they also viewed as evidence for a future kingdom to come and not a present reality. And some of these were the passages I gave you to research from the book of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah chapter two, Isaiah chapter three, 35, Isaiah chapter 65, we will look at, at some of these because their argument is that these prophecies have not been realized. Again, they are looking at them in a literal sense because they, their main um, position is that we should interpret the Bible literally. But we recognize that that cannot be a holistic um, position in terms of the interpretation of the Bible because there's a lot of figurative language used and we see it very, very evident. And so if we have a holistic approach to interpreting the Bible in a literal way, we're going to misinterpret and misrepresent a lot of things. 
and then we will miss the, the intention of the writers of, of these particular passages because we are looking for a literal interpretation when in essence, the language that they're using is prophetic language and very often prophetic language is expressed in a figurative way. And if we, we miss that, then we would have a different conclusion. And when you look at some of the passages that, that you research and we look at them closely, you will see why they are indicating that it has not happened as yet. And therefore it could only happen in the millennium when we come to a perfect age where the lion will lay down with the lamb, the little child shall put his hand in the den of a snake and, and will not be harmed. That we will beat our sores into plowshares and our spears into pruning hook. And nation shall not rise against nation and there shall not be any, any war or things of, of that nature. Um, the lion shall lay down with the lamb, a little child shall live to a thousand years and you will still be considered as, as, as a person, sorry, will live to a thousand years and still be considered as young. So what they're saying is that these passages, um, when you read them, have not been fulfilled. We cannot claim that these things have happened. Have happened. The reason why they are expecting that these things are to be literally interpreted. And we will, we will examine some of these passages along with some other Old Testament passages, because there are numerous references in the Old Testament in relation to the kingdom of God. And we will try to get an understanding as to what the passages are really saying, what they are what they're indicating. Is it figurative language meant to be interpreted in that way and have a symbolic meaning, still referring to the kingdom of God and pointing to the actual reality of, of Christ coming and reigning in the hearts of people and bringing about change in the nature of the way people function and the way we relate to each other and, and, and changes basically in, 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 our, in our world as such as a result of, of Jesus's presence and his coming in into the world. People who walk in darkness have seen a great light and that light that is shining in our hearts brings about change and, and causes uh, um, things to be different in, in a spiritual sense. So those were some of the uh, objections that were identified. And I think we had a very good discussion and, and many of you um, were able to express your thoughts and give some very good responses um, to some of these objections. And we're able also to give good indications as to why you believe that the kingdom of God is a present reality and in a spiritual sense Christ is reigning in the hearts and lives of people. So we will look at a few more New Testament um, passages. I, I will hold those Old Testament passages for when we start to do the millennium and to, and to see um, where the, the, the error would have occurred in terms of the interpretation because again the error in the way they interpreted the millennium came as a result of a literal interpretation, again, from a passage that was very, very symbolic. The whole book itself in Revelation, the, the bulk of it was written in symbolic language and therefore it is to be interpreted that way. And then we will be able to see um, if we can justify their particular line of argument in relation um, to those passages. And after we just view some of, of these passages, and if you have questions or, or, or comments that you want to make in relation to these New Testament passages that we look at, because we said that is one of the principles that we should try to operate by in interpreting the world. The word, look at the New Testament um, references because they give us a, a very clear indication of, of how the word is to be interpreted and how it compares with the Old Testament um, um, passages and then after we look at, at those New Testament passages, we will go to Daniel because we proceeded to look at the timing. We were, we were trying to understand the nature of the kingdom. That was the, the rationale for those questions, the nature of the kingdom. And then we were looking at the timing of the kingdom. What was prophesied about Christ coming and how that was fulfilled in actual historical reality. And so we will look in a little more detail 
Daniel chapter 9 and try to unpack it verse by verse so as to get a very clear and precise understanding. And, and, and then we will also link that with some other things that are connected to that, that whole prophecy so that we get a, a good grasp of what the word of God is, is revealing to us. And, and I guess also get as excited as I do when we, we get to see how the word of God is connected, how it comes together, how the whole drama unfolds, how the whole plan and design of a God who sees the future and understands everything, brings things together and connects them. And when we see that connection, it enlightens us. As I said, it, it adds strength and stability to the word and the reliability and the credibility of it and that we can stand on it and defend it and live our lives in accordance with it because we see evidence that it is coming from the, from the heart and the mind of our omnipotent God. And that's why we study the word because it, it, it is meant to reveal God to us. It is also um, a means of helping us to understand ourselves and see how we need to relate and connect to God's purpose and plan for us. That's the overall plan and design of the word that we have with us. And when we can see it unfold before us and we see the truth revealed that it is the word of God, the authentic, unadulterated word of God, not things that man put together to deceive people as some people have concluded, but it is from the mind of God and it established the reality of a divine creator who is interested in the affairs of this world and of our lives in an intimate way. And we get to understand that true prophecy. So let's look at some New Testament passages. I, I can go through them pretty quickly, but you can make a note of them that you can read again on your own. And, and, and these are passages to establish the reality of the kingdom of God being present at the advent of Christ. Christ came and he established a kingdom. And remember when we look at Daniel chapter 2, looking at the timing, Daniel established that the kingdom would come at the reign of the Roman Empire. And that at that time, God would set up his kingdom, which will last forever. So that is not a kingdom projected for two or, or, or more than 2,000 years in the future. Daniel was indicating that during the reign of the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom precisely stated. We have to accept that that is the authoritative word of God and establish then the belief that the kingdom of God was established when Jesus came into the world and it was during the time of the Roman Empire, during the reign of Augustus Caesar, the first emperor. He was the one that made a decree about the taxation and things of that nature. And then Herod, one of the, of the, the rulers and the governors of, of that time, was the one who tried to, to get rid of Jesus um, at the time of his birth. We're going to try to connect some of these things in relation to the, the time reference or the timeline given to us in the book of Daniel. After we finish these New Testament passages, I will give a break for um, some questions or some comments that you want to make, and then we will try to unpack Daniel in, in, in a greater detail. We read it through last week, but as I indicated, that we're going to go through it, that you get a very clear understanding and, and you see that there's more to it than even just a timeline. There are some significant things in, in, in that passage which we need to understand, that help us to understand about the kingdom and the purpose of Christ when he did come and what it's connected to. So Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15 says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. Watch that carefully. Watch that statement. The time is fulfilled. What time? The time that was prophesied in relation to his coming into the world to establish a kingdom. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28 to 29. 
It says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can we enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Now, as I indicated previously, that is a reference that will become very significant when we are looking at the binding of Satan and what it means spiritually or figuratively and not literally as part of the interpretation of that passage of Revelation 20 by the other religious teachers of the premillennial group. Luke chapter 4 verse 43 and he said unto them I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities who because for this purpose I was sent. He was sent to preach the kingdom and he will preach it in other cities. And what is the sense of preaching the kingdom if it is not then a present reality? John 3.3, 3, Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he is speaking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus is trying to get some understanding about some spiritual realities and Jesus told him he has to be born again and he thinking again now in a literal sense wanted to find out what that meant and Jesus is explaining to him now the spiritual application you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God then Matthew 16 28 I think that was mentioned verily I say unto you there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom so if the kingdom was a future thing that we are still looking for, why would Jesus make a statement saying to people that there are some of them who are standing there that will be alive when the kingdom of God come? And he was speaking about when the kingdom of God came in its fullness, as we indicated that some persons interpret it that way, coming in its fullness on, on the day of Pentecost. Because the kingdom of God would, be, would already be present from the time Jesus start his ministry, start his ministry, and start to proclaim um, the gospel in Galilee. Then Luke 16, 16, another important verse, and this is going to be connected to one of, of the things mentioned in Daniel chapter 9 when we get there. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. This is Jesus speaking, the law and the kingdom. And remember Daniel um, speaking about bringing an end to prophecy. So, so the law and, and the prophets had a time period in which they make their proclamations, and that was until John. Now Jesus has come. He is preaching of the, of the kingdom. There's, there, there's no, not going to be any more prophecy related to the, to the kingdom because Jesus is now here preaching about the kingdom and its reality, and that people can be part of it. How can you press into something that is non-existent? So Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is preached, and men can press into it. You can enter the kingdom. We already talked about John 18, 36. I need not expound on that. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from hence. Meaning it is, it is not according to the, the, the customs of how kingdoms are established. People took that to mean that he meant that it was not a present reality. That's not what Jesus meant as we explained. Then Colossians 1, 12 to 13. Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers, of the inheritance of saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He is speaking to the church at Colossae and speaking to, to people who have been converted. And Paul sees that as being translated from the kingdom of darkness, which was the present reality. And then we, we have been translated into the kingdom of God's son. So we, we don't look for Satan's kingdom to be a, a future reality. We recognize is already present. So why are we looking for the kingdom of God to be a future reality when we are translated from the kingdom of darkness 
And the Bible indicates that Satan is a, is a ruler in his own sense in this world. So he has power and authority and he has subjects. And we are translated when we get saved, according to the Apostle Paul, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of God's dear son, Jesus. So it has to be a present reality for transfer to take place. We enter the kingdom of God by conversion. Now, I should point out to you that in the Luke 17, 21 passage, they have, they have actually written um, a different interpretation to, to that passage where the King James Version says the kingdom is within you. They are saying that the kingdom of God is among you. That is the new Revised Standard Version. Or the NIV says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. You see, they're trying to get away from our argument that the spiritual reality of God being in us. I remember I said that they were trying to argue that Jesus could not have been telling the Pharisees who were, who were unrighteous people and who he described as hypocrites that the kingdom of God was within them. And I said to you, it was a generic term that Jesus was using. He was generalizing and, and saying that the kingdom of God is going to be within the hearts and lives of people. Now, their translations indicate a, a different reading. Now, the reality is that that same word, that same Greek word that is used, that King James translates within you, that they are saying, you no, know, it could mean the, in the midst of you or among you, meaning that Jesus was trying to tell them, I am in your midst. I am the kingdom. I am among you. So it is me that the kingdom is all about. And not really saying to them that the kingdom of God is, is a spiritual experience on the inside. But the, 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 um, the response or the rebuttal to that is that the same Greek word, evtok, E-V-T-O-C, has been used in another passage in, in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it is only used twice in the New Testament. That one that, that King James translates as within. And then there's another passage in Matthew 23, 26, where Jesus says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse thou first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean too. And the word used there is the same Greek word that King James translated as within. That is the same word that was used for within the cup. Within the cup, which means inside the cup. So, so, so to come and say then that it means in the midst of you when it is used in another reference to mean within and not among or in the midst of. Because it could not mean in that context among or in the midst of. It meant within the cup. And in the same sense, then it meant within the hearts and lives of people. And I believe that that's the correct um, translation to that text. The, the, the word was actually indicating that the kingdom of God is a spiritual experience which is on the inside. All right, I'll pause there for any comments you want to make. If you want to, to say anything in relation to the passage that you read and what they mean to you or or perhaps what might puzzle you about them. As I said, we will, we will link them to when we come to do the millennial kingdom. So we will study those in, in a little more detail when we, when we get there and understand the spiritual application to those verses. But if you want to make any comment or perhaps put any question or any difficulty you might have had in reading them, um, you can also say what you feel to on those particular passages, or you can comment on some of the New Testament passages I just read to you. If they make it clear for you um, that in reality, the teaching of the New Testament was that the kingdom of God was indeed a present reality. So I open at this point for any questions or comments before we get into Daniel in, in, in greater depth, Daniel chapter 9. Yes, Reverend John. Good night. Good night to you. Good. Question, not question. 
Now, I was doing some searching, mm -hmm. and I come across a professor by the name of Michael Morrison. And one of his arguments, he's using Matthew 26, 29, as oh. to say, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink with you anew in my Father's kingdom. So he yes. is using this passage to say that Jesus himself ref is in this passage is referring to a future kingdom. What when you read it, what says you? Yes, but he is he, he, he is he is Randy. He is related. He is speaking of a future kingdom. Now remember we I say mean, the kingdom he, the he, kingdom of God is a present reality. But he was referring to a physical kingdom that yeah, but, but, himself set but up. Jesus didn't say they say that that is the kingdom of God, that is the eternal kingdom. And Jesus is speaking of the reality of that experience to his disciples. We we will be together again and we will celebrate. But we'll be celebrating in, in the eternal kingdom, which is the future kingdom to come. So yes, he's speaking of a kingdom to come, but he's not speaking of the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. He, he did not say that. And a lot of passages that people, um, as I say, when you read, I was going to ask you that question. When you read those passages, do you see any mention of a millennial kingdom? There is no, no. mention anywhere in the Old Testament mm -hmm. passages. If you see it, you've got to tell me of a millennial kingdom. But yet they are saying that these passages are re referring to the millennial kingdom. So yet Jesus is speaking of a future kingdom. The eternal kingdom is a kingdom. We, we are reigning here with Christ now on the earth, but we will reign with him in eternity. That is the eternal kingdom. God will still be king. He will still have subjects and we will still be in a place. Those, those, those are the things that identify a kingdom. It has to be somewhere. It has to have subjects and it has to have laws and, 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 and a ruler and a king. And Christ's kingdom, when Daniel said it will be established forever, it will have no end. We are enjoying part of it here now in a spiritual sense, but there is better to come when we get into that eternal kingdom. So I would agree with him. Yes, he's speaking of future kingdom, but not a physical kingdom in the millennial sense that they are speaking of because that's the only kingdom they are talking about. The millennial kingdom and Christ obviously if that was so significant he would have told his disciples about that and I I always ask that question why is it that Jesus spent so much time teaching his disciples and talking about significant spiritual things and would never have mentioned to them about a millennial kingdom he prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem while he was here corresponding to what Daniel saw as we will we will see but yet and he talked about the new covenant that was to come but why would he have talked about such an important event to come in the future? That 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 would be very puzzling to, to, to wonder why he would not have mentioned. And Jesus never mentioned a millennial kingdom. He never did. That's that's people's interpretation. So that's my response to that, Brother Randy. He is he is talking about the future kingdom, but he's talking about the consummate kingdom. Okay. Which, yes, which is established when he returns. Um, and he brings an end to all earthly kingdoms, all authorities and powers subject to him, and he then takes us to our eternal place, which is the consummate kingdom. That, that's what Jesus is saying. We will do that again when we get into the eternal kingdom. All right, you, you asked for a response to the things that we read. Yes. And I... I, 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 I would just put it this way that I think Christ was referring to that when he comes, yes, he would bring about a new order of things. Yes. And I, I saw that order out as peace, where there wouldn't be people, if they embrace him, would be able to live in harmony and peace with each other. And yes. then you have some of the figurative things when he liken it onto a sheep laying down with a lamb. Uh, right. I shall claim with this so that's why I, I I I can only tie that down to, as I said then if everybody accepts Christ then what is what would happen is that a new order of peace will come about okay all right good so 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 that that is the way 
our, our theologians interpret that same reference. Of course, we have other references. And you see, what we need to understand, when we are looking for a, 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 a literal reality of things, we need to understand that there, there, there has to be a, 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 a connection between the people you are talking about who are really given over to the rule and authority. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the nature of the kingdom. People who are subject to the authority and the rule of Christ. When people submit to that rule and that authority in the way they ought to, then a whole lot of things will come into place. There will be peace and harmony. There will be no war. So the reason why we still have those things or those things were still present at Christ's time is because not everybody was subject to the authority of Christ. And remember, Jesus says that some will come in the last day saying, Lord, Lord, did I do this? I do that. He would say, I never knew you. Which means that there are people who are, are pretending to be part of the kingdom but are really not in the, in, in essence, truly connected to the sovereign rule and authority of God. And that's why we will still have malice and, and, and sin and we will still have unrest and we will still have war. But among the people who are subject to the authority and rule, there is peace, there is harmony, there is love. There, is, there is, is a new order which really takes place in people who are truly submitted to Christ. And that's the way you have to interpret that. And if you, you don't see that, then you'll be pointing out to all the things that are going wrong. Just like when we interpret the literal binding of Satan. Because the argument is, how can Satan be bound and yet you still have sin, you still have evil, you still have all these things. But Satan being bound does not mean that he is inactive. It does not mean that things can't happen because really and truly, and I, I'm just saying this before we get there, but when you when you bind Satan, sin still is in the heart of, of people and you will still sin if, if, if you could literally, physically bind Satan, people will still sin because it is, it is, it is it their nature to sin. And, and so we will get a better understanding of what that means. But that was just a little part I was showing in there to show you why it is important that you understand a, a symbolic, uh, a figurative expression and, and not necessarily take it literally. And we will explain why that cannot be taken literally when we get to Revelation 20, because there are a whole lot of other things in there that if you take them literally, it is going to throw you off in the understanding of the word. So yes, Randy, that that's um, my response to that statement. And I, 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 I like your understanding of of that passage which speaks about the land laying down with the lamb and those things. It, it, it does not mean literally, it is, it is a, a change in nature and we will be able to get along the land and the lamb. Uh, Rev, we have yes. Ian Innes. Ian Innes has either a comment or a question. Yes, yes, brother Ian. Good, good evening. Um, good, good evening. Um, yes. I would I would have missed last week, but I was looking at something here in relation to what you just said. I'm thinking about the woman at the well. Yes. Um, John chapter 4, mm -hmm. where Jesus told the woman at the well, <clears throat> you worship, you know not what. Yes. Mm -hmm. We know what we worship for. Salvation of, is of the Jews. And anyway, not to say, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the mm -hmm. Father seeking such to work for him. Um, was Jesus um, saying no that this is him being here? Just know that the kingdom is right here in front of her. Is that what he was trying to say in this statement based on what you were sharing earlier this evening? Yes, in essence. But you see, because again, we, we always have to remember that that Jesus speak also, spoke very also in, in, um, in, in figurative language. Because he went on to tell her about the water that she was seeking. And he said, the water I give you. He was not speaking of, of literal, physical water. He was speaking of spiritual. So, so again, he's explained to her what is the nature of the, of the kingdom and what is the nature of the change. And also, she was looking at the location as well. Because as far as the Jews understood, God dwelt in Jerusalem. That is the holy place and the holy city. But Jesus is saying that, that the time is going to come when there's not going to be any 
concentrate on a physical locality, a physical location, because this the spirit of God is going to be everywhere and, and people are going to have access to God because the Gentiles are going to come in and they are not going to be in Jerusalem. They'll be all parts of the Roman Empire and they will still have access to God's holy presence and they'll be able to enter into the Holy of Holies because it's now not in a temple made with hands because the temple was rent in twain when Jesus got crucified. For us, that's very, very significant. A lot of things that sometimes we, we, we don't see the, the, um, the depth of the application, we realize when we, we start to look at it closely, that renting of the veil again was a spiritual representation of what happened at Jesus' crucifixion. You now no longer have to get somebody going in to represent you in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is your holy priest. And you, you now have free access. That's the significance of that by, by the, the veil being rent in twain. We now can access the, 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 the Holy of Holies through Christ, our mediator, and don't have to have any priests going into mediate for us on the Day of Atonement. That has been settled by Christ. And that was one of the things that Daniel mentioned, the atoning blood of Christ settled that sort of, of transgression and rebellion that we have had and give us access um, to God. Yes, yeah, so but Ian, right, there's a spurs application to that as well. Rev? Mm -hmm. Rev, we also have Pastor Carrington. I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question, but Pastor Carrington. Yes, Brother John. Let's get it, Eddie. Sorry, Good night. Brother John. Apologies. No, that, that's all right. That's all right, John. <laughs> so they call you John. <laughs> the same quote you used just now um, about the renting of the, the rent of the veil in the temple. Yes. Some, some have suggested that that is a symbolic representation of the Shekinah glory leaf in the temple. Um, in as uh, represented as Jesus, um, Jesus departing the temple for the last time. But that would have been the last time, the last time when Jesus left the temple when he went to the hill. Um, and Bethany, when he, when he cried for the Jews, he said, Um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how he would have taken you on the means like a hen with her chicks, but you would not. Yes. And that was a symbolic representation. Um, that that turn of the veil from top to bottom of the kind of glory leaving the temple, and that would have been God's judgment on the spiritual wickedness of the Jews. How do you see yes. that? Yes. No, I agree with that. Because well, well, it brings an end to one thing. Remember, the destruction of Jerusalem brought an end to the, the, the focus on Jerusalem as the holy place and the removal of the Jews as the ones who were supposed to bring the everlasting righteousness through their um, living in accordance with the word of God. Remember, because God was using the, the Jews to be the light to the Gentiles. That was their purpose and their, and, their, and their mission. Because of their rebellion and disobedience, they failed to fulfill that purpose. And God says, remember, and he, he probably gave you, he will take the kingdom from them and give it to one bring forth fruit. So that represented a symbol movement now of, of, the, of the purpose of what the Jews were supposed to represent now to the church. Of course, Jews would have been in the, in the New Testament church. But now the emphasis is not now on the Jews and Jerusalem. It is, is on Christ in the life of, of, of everybody working to, to, to bring in the, the righteous standard that, that he wants. So God's glory, yes, would have been leaving the temple. It represents a departure from what Jerusalem and what that temple represented. And now a new covenant is being established, which we will, we will see also as we look at parallels to what um, Daniel is showing us. So yes, that application is also correct. So while we are moving God's glory from there, because we're not, we are not using any priest anymore to go into the Holy of Holies, and only the priests had access to the Holy of Holies, we, that, that now is, is, is given access to us freely. We are, therefore, we can come boldly before the throne of God, where we can obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. The throne is open to us, to everyone, and we don't have to have a priest entering in um, to, to, to do that for us. And, and there was even a parallel to, to, to that in, in relation to what, what Daniel saw in the revelation of the angel Gabriel at the time he came, 
And at the time Jesus died, there's a connection there, but I leave that to when we get in, in, into Daniel. And the same Gabriel, when he appeared to Zechariah, to announce the, the, the time, the time was at hand for the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah was right in front of the, the veil in the Holy of Holies, getting ready to make his sacrifice at the same time that Gabriel appeared to Daniel and gave him the revelation of the 70 weeks. Powerful connection. And, and all this is, is connected to, to Christ now fulfilling all of that. And, and he now is the one who, who takes us into the holy place by being our intercessor, our mediator, and not the priest. So both applications are correct. And thank you for that one, um, Brother John, because I also uh, would have seen mention of that. So it's the ending of one and beginning of another. It's, it's the removal of, of God's glory from the temple and from the purpose that the temple was established in Jerusalem and the covenant established with the Jews. And now there's going to be a transfer. All right. Thank you for those comments and those questions. If you have any more, you can hold them back a little. Now we are going to get into Daniel chapter 9 and try to unpack Daniel chapter 9. So we're going to pick up from a little higher up. If you have your Bibles, I hope you, you have them. You can follow along with me. All right. Daniel chapter 9, we're going to pick up from verse 21. Now remember we indicated that Daniel was in prayer, and I think from verse 3 down to verse 19, yes, called verse 20, says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, see, that's intercessory prayer, and, and Daniel was really seriously interceding on behalf of his people because he had read in, in Jeremiah, and we will get to those passages, um, what the prophecy was, so he read the word and he had a clear understanding of the timing was coming close in the 70 years. And so he is making an intercession on behalf of himself and his people confessing their sin to seek God's um, intervention and that God would, would, well, God would honor his word and keep his word. But he is looking for the restoration of the Jewish people back to their the promised land. And, and back to the place from which they had fallen and looking for the establishment of a, of a, of a spiritual um, presence by, in, 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 with God. So that's the context of that. So while he was praying, verse 21 says, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, and, and, and why the man Gabriel, now Gabriel is an angel, but why he said man Gabriel, because I believe that this is the form that Gabriel would have, have appeared. So that John, so that Daniel, sorry, is not now like in a vision. The, he has the real presence of, of Gabriel appear to him in that form. I remember Gabriel had appeared to him before, if you would have preceded the reading to Daniel chapter 8, you would remember that he had a vision and he was trying to understand it and Gabriel came and, and Daniel fainted. And so he did not get the full um, revelation or interpretation, but the angel appears to him again sometime after that. I think some people say it was a number of years after. And Gabriel comes back. I said, he says, Gabriel, whom I had seen in, in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That's the time of the evening oblation is about three o'clock. So Daniel, even though he was removed from his homeland, he still kept the Jewish traditions. That's, that's the wonderful thing about when the word of God is in your heart and the traditions have, have been established in your heart. Daniel prayed three times a day. He prayed the morning oblation, which is the, the morning sacrifice, afternoon time, and in the evening oblation, which is about three o'clock. That's the time that Daniel, sorry, that Gabriel would have approached Zechariah, as I mentioned before, at the evening oblation, when he was there making the sacrifice. And, and that is the time that Jesus was crucified. 
Jesus was crucified at the time of the evening sacrifice at three o'clock. He died at three o'clock. Time of the evening oblation. That's the connection. So Gabriel came and made the announcement to Daniel about the coming of the Messiah. He appeared, same Gabriel, again to Zechariah, and made the announcement of the child that he will have, who will be the forerunner of Jesus. So he is, he is confirming the timeline. And then Jesus himself, when he was actually crucified, because remember, Daniel had prophesied, well, well I, I say Daniel, but it's the, it's the Gabriel that gave him the, um, the revelation that the Messiah will come and he will be cut off. And Jesus was cut off at the, the same evening sacrifice. Three o'clock, he died. That was the commencement of the evening oblation. That's the connection. So, and he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give the skill and understanding. At the beginning of this supplication, the commandment came forth. From the time Daniel started to pray, Gabriel got the instruction. And I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So we often talk about Daniel's 40 weeks, Daniel's 70 weeks, sorry. But like we, we make the mistake in talking about John's revelation. It was Jesus' revelation given to John. Yeah, it's recorded in, in, in the revelation written by John. So we, we, we tend to, to say John, but remember, it was Jesus giving the revelation to John. In the same context here, we often say Daniel's um, 70 weeks. They're not Daniel's 70 weeks. The information is coming from heaven, sent by Gabriel to explain to Daniel what is going to happen. So it is the information coming from God. It's, it's the interpretation that God is giving. And it is not Daniel seeing these things. It is what Gabriel is telling him. So he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. These are the things that the 70 weeks are given for. 70 weeks are determined. Now, you go back to the original, it says 70 sevens because the concept of, of seven was very, very important in the Jewish tradition. And, and, and right through the Bible, we see the significance of seven. And, and there was a word which they, would, they used for, for seven, um, which was Shavuot, S-H-A-U-A-H, Shavuot, S-H-A-V-U-A-H. That means sevens. Is like we use the word dozen, meaning 12. So seven would be the, the seven of something. The Shavuot would be the seven of something. But the word Shavuot also means a covenant or oath or pledge. And this was the same word that, that was used when you go back to the Old Testament with Abraham taking Isaac, his son, to offer and, 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 and God intervened and said because of, of what Abraham had done, he is going to make a shavuot, which he's going to make a pledge or an oath that what happened in relation to Daniel would be a type or a fulfillment that will come in Christ. So right there in that experience, God was indicating a, a, a type that was to be fulfilled. And, and sometimes when we look at, at things, we, we don't get the, the depth of them to see the application. So Isaac was the only son that Abraham was going to offer. Jesus is the only son that God has given. Isaac took Abraham, sorry, Abraham took Isaac up on a donkey, took him to Mount Moriah. Jesus came into Jerusalem as God's only son, riding on a donkey. Abraham took up some wood that he was going to use to offer Isaac as a sacrifice and give it to, to Isaac to carry. Jesus had to carry his cross on which he was going to be sacrificed. The wood of which the cross was made, Jesus, the son, carried. Watch the parallel. He, he was on Mount, Mount, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah later became the Temple Mount. That's where the temple was established. 
That's where Jerusalem was built, the city of David, built about a thousand years after this experience here. David built the city of Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Um, Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on Mount Moriah, so Calvary that we, we mentioned would be in, on the same mountain, the parallel. So you see the connection. So that was an oath that, that God would have made that is going to be a parallel to, to the coming of Christ. So, so Abraham's experience was very significant in that we can see the parallel coming um, in Christ. So that word was a very significant word. And the, the angel, um, Gabriel, is saying to Daniel, 70 weeks have been decreed. We have the word here determined, but it means decreed. It is set out. And, and that's a, a very important word that sometimes we use very loosely and we must be careful of not um, trivializing the meaning of decree. Because very often we, we hear, you know, it's a common phrase of a, or expression, I declare, I decree. That decree is a, is a very strong word because um, kings made decrees which were like law. They were things that were determined. But when the application comes to God, a, a decree is something that is, is binding and that will happen. No kings can make decrees, but but they are human. But when God makes a decree, that that is is, is something that you can expect to happen. So we, we should not just loosely decree things because we don't really have the authority to decree things because we can't determine what will happen. So we, we can't just use that word loosely because that's a very strong word when you are decreeing something. You're actually using a word that God uses, which God has a right to, because God can decree something. We really can't decree anything because we can't determine that something will happen. That's, that's in the hands of God. So it's decreed that 70 weeks are going to be set aside, and these will be weeks of years, 77s. There are weeks of years. Now, why were the children of Israel taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. It was a punishment. And the punishment came because they fail, failed to obey the Sabbaths that were ordained for them to obey. This was the Sabbath now of our, this was the agricultural Sabbath, which meant that they were to rest the land every seven years. And up to Samuel, that's what they did. But from the time Saul became king, they, they started to, to disobey that command and fail to rest the land. So for all the time that they refused to rest the land and disobeyed, they are now being punished and given these 70 years in Babylon so that the land will have the, the time to rest as it should have. But they disobeyed God's command. So you can see how serious God takes command in, or instructions if you disobey them. So they are going to be taken away. Daniel was in that first um, movement. 605 was, was, was the first um, overtaking of, of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar because he, he would have overtaken um, Jerusalem, Judea on more than one occasion. But the first exile was in 605 and Daniel was part of that exile. So having read Jeremiah, and I'm going to, to let you see the passage in Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah chapter 25. So we can look at that so you can see the connection here. Jeremiah tw chapter 25. I'm going to read from verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation save the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldees and I will make it a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced. See, when God makes the decree, it happens. Against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. So Daniel read that prophecy of the 70 years. And so the time was drawing close. It was about, um, about two more years to go. And that's why Daniel entered in, into, the, into in that prayer. You could also see the same 
reference in Daniel uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, but we don't have to turn to that because that will be repeating the same thing. So that's the prophecy that, that Daniel has been, been praying about. So God is going to give the Jews again an opportunity because watch it. The 70 weeks have been decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city. The people, meaning the Jews, the, the, the Daniel's people were still considered as the Jews. He still maintained that connection. He maintained the traditions and he refused to accept the traditions and the pagan cultures of um, Babylon. And he maintained the traditions and the godly things that were established in his heart. And so the Gabriel is saying, God is going to, to the decree a time. He's going to set up a time. 490 years, 70 weeks or 77 actually prophetically will work out to 490 years. And what God, what God is saying through Gabriel, Daniel, your people are not going to, to, to reap the promises that I have indicated to them. They have been disobedient. They have been punished. But I will give them time. My mercy will give them time. They have 490 years. Now we have we have seen the result of their continual and perpetual disobedience in the destruction of the temple where Jesus prophesied when he um, was on earth and he told them, remember what Daniel said. All the world that they had been given chance to change 490 years. And again, you can see a connection here. Remember Jesus was asked, how often shall you forgive your brother? And he said 70 times seven. So even though it's not meant to be an exact number, you can see again the connection here. God himself is giving the Jews mercy and forgiveness. 70 times seven. 70 years they were given in Babylon, but God is going to multiply 70 times of forgiveness and give them 490 years, seven, seven, 70 sevens for them to finish the transgression. That means bring an end to their rebellion and disobedience. To make an end of, this, of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up division and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And rather than anoint the most holy, they crucified the most holy. And remember the parable that Jesus said to them in Matthew chapter 22, which we looked at. Jesus said, the prophets came and you killed the prophets. And God sent his son and rather receive him, you kill his son. Now, these are connected to the Jews and to the holy city, but Jesus is also implied in these. Because these things can only happen if they allow the Messiah when he comes to fulfill these things in their own experience. Because that is what Jesus is going to come to do. To bring an end to the transgression and the rebellion. To bring an end to, to sin. And, and atone but through his life. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To bring an end to vision and prophecy because what Jesus is here now, there's not going to be any prophecy because the prophecies were up to John. Remember when Jesus was on the, the road to Emmaus, he spoke to those disciples who could not understand what had happened. And Jesus took them all back to the Old Testament from Moses down and told him all of these scriptures prophesied of me. But you, you didn't get the understanding. So the Jews missed out on the opportunity to be reconciled, to be atoned for, to bring an end to their rebellion, to allow Christ when he came in, in, his, in his fullness to bring them to the place that Daniel wanted them to be. And the angel Gabriel said, Daniel, no, it's not yet. They got 490 years. And before God brings judgment, he always gave a time for repentance. When God had promised that he would flood the world, those people were given 120 years to repent and they refused to repent and they were destroyed because of their rebellion. The Jews had 490 years to make an end of their rebellion and disobedience. And, and even Moses, if you go back to Leviticus 26, and Nehemiah, 
when he was making supplication to, because remember when Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the city, he went and made supplication to King Artaxerxes, and he, he started to quote the, per, the, the, sorry, the, the prophecy that was made by Moses in Leviticus 26. You can read that. In Leviticus 26, Moses pointed out to them that if they continue to disobey God's instructions and not obey his commandments, that he would punish them and he would allow their enemies to take them away as, as, as servants. And so Nehemiah would have also read the scripture and what in his prayer, like Daniel in his prayer, making reference to Jeremiah, Nehemiah in his prayer, as he was making intercession for the people again, he was ref he was going back to the to the, the um the prophecy made by Moses as to what will happen to them way back in Leviticus if they continue to disobey. And while they were given an opportunity, they refused. So this was a prophecy about the Messiah and what he would do, but there's also a time period given to the Jews to make reconciliation and bring an end to their rebellion because God, in, in, in a sense, is, is giving them 70 times seven of their years for, for mercy and grace. And the sad reality, and, and, re, and every time you read the history of the Jews, it really hurts you. You see, he came to his own, and his own received him not, but as many as receive him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Listen to what um, Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 19. You can turn to that because this is connected. Luke chapter 19. Verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. This is Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Now remember, Jesus' ministry was in Galilee. But the first thing he's coming to Jerusalem is during his triumphant entry. And while he was coming to Jerusalem, and there are some people who, who give the timeline as to the Jesus' triumphant entry. Now, I told you that, that Daniel actually gave a timeline for when the Messiah was going to be present on the earth and doing ministry. We will not get too carried away by the timeline in terms of a date because th there are a lot of, of difficulties connected with that in trying to establish the specific date in relation to a specific time of, of things connected to Jesus. And I'll explain to you why. But this one says in Luke 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, in this thy day, this has been prophesied for you, you know, I am coming to, to, to do what Daniel indicated would happen, to give you time to change the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and come past thee round, and keep thee in on every side. Remember, he was prophesying now about the destruction of Jerusalem because the Jews are not going to accept Christ as the Messiah. And shall lay even with and, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Because you do not know the time of your visitation. In other words, what Jesus is saying, this was prophesied. This is the time of your visitation. I am here. I weep over you because I long to fulfill the mercy that God had given to you to repent and change your way, and you would not. And therefore, you're going to go into destruction like the people in those times had time to repent, did not do it, and destruction will come on the city and on the people. And, and that was what was mentioned here um, in, in, in Daniel, those things that were mentioned. And he goes on, Know therefore and understand, I'm at verse 25, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall 
even in troublous, troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and sanctuary. Here, here is the prophecy here of what will happen if they don't obey. And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of war and desolation are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause this oblation and the sacrifice to cease. Now, this is where it gets complex. And this is where a lot of misinterpretation takes place. Now, the, the 70 weeks, which is 490 years, is broken down into three distinct periods. The first one is seven sevens, which is 49 years. The other period is 62 weeks or 62 years, which is 434 years. And then there's one other seven, which is left that will complete the 490 years. So we have 49 years, 434 years, and then we have another seven years, which is the last week. Now, this is the week that the premillennials take out. They subtract that from the 490 and said this is the 70th week which is to come in the future this is the week of seven year tribulation and that is their understanding now can you see that anywhere in the text you tell me when I give you a chance for you to respond that is nowhere mentioned in the text that there is a seven year period of tribulation and that the seven years is a cut off point 490 years is the total period that has been given for all of these things to be done. The first seven, which is 49 years, is for the completion of the city and the rebuilding of the wall, which Josephus said was a, was, could have been accomplished about that time period. Then you add on the 62 weeks to those 49, and it brings you to 483 years. 434 plus the 49 will bring you to 483. And what the angel is saying to Gabriel, um, to, to Daniel, is that after 483 years, the Messiah is going to come. Now, does the coming mean his birth? Does it mean his coming into Jerusalem to announce himself, announce, uh, announce himself as king? Or is, is his coming mean his coming to the start of his ministry after he was baptized by John in the River Jordan? When the Holy Spirit descended upon him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was the, uh, the anointing of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit on him. And some people see that at the time period. So this is why I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, to get you tied up with the actual timeline. I want you to see the significance of this prophecy of, apart from that. Reason why? Because it says that before, but from the time the decree is given to rebuild the wall, you add on the 483 years, and that's the time that represents the Messiah being on earth. Now, people have tried to connect that to a specific time, and we get variations because there were three decrees given. There was one given by Cyrus in, in Ezra chapter one. You can read that. We're not going to go, go through all of them. And it, it it was um, identified in Second Chronicles chapter 36. So when you turn from, from chapter 36 in Second Chronicles, and you go to Ezra 1, you'll see the decree given by Cyrus. And the decree was mentioned by Isaiah. Now, some people don't want to take that as the time for the decree. Then there was another one given by Artaxerxes when Ezra went to him. And then there was another one given when Nehemiah went to him. At different time periods, people are now trying to decide now which one of those decrees do we start the timeline? And that's where you get variations and that's where you get differences. So I'm not going to try to confuse you with the timing tonight because we will have to go through some specific um, times when these decrees were given and, and counting the, the 483 years to see um, where it could, it could come. So I'm not going to complicate your head with that. What you need to understand is that the 490 weeks completes everything. So you can't take the seven weeks out or the seven years. Remember, they're weeks of years. 
and project that into the future. That's wrong theology because the text does not tell you to do that and the text was not done. Now, how does this apply to the Messiah? In that last week is when the final part of, of this whole scenario is going on for the last seven years and in the middle of that period, that's when Jesus was crucified. He started his ministry and three and a half years, years later, he is cut off or he is crucified. That's in the middle of the week, the middle of the seven years. That's three and a half years. That is not any three and a half years that the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel. The text does not say that. The text is talking about the prince to come of the Messiah who will be cut off. And he will bring an end to the sacrifice and the oblations, meaning that Jesus' death is an atonement for all the sacrifice of lambs and rams and goats that were offered in the temple before. Because Jesus is now the sacrifice. He brings an end to all of that. There's no more need to sacrifice anymore. That's what that means. In the three and a half years, halfway, in the middle of that seven year period, Jesus is crucified and brings an end to that. He atones for the sin of all mankind. And we will have references I will show you that would, would, would confirm that. And when you read Hebrews, read Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10, where Paul explains this whole new covenant. I remember Jesus told his disciples when he was taking the last supper with them, he said, this represents the new covenant of my blood. It's a new covenant that is going to be established. The old one has brought an end. All of those sacrifices, Jesus has now is going to be the atonement for, for many, as Daniel said. And we will show you verses that actually said that. So the other three and a half years now, because you were wondering, oh, well, there's supposed to be seven years. So what happens the other three and a half? The other three and a half years is a grace period. That after the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, and the disciples are now proclaiming the resurrection and spreading the word. Even the Jews try to cover up the resurrection and, and, and try to join in a lance with the Romans to cover up the resurrection of Jesus. Rather than open up themselves to the realization, they now have another three and a half years to complete the, the, the fulfillment of the 490 years and, and they blow that. Stephen preached to them and warned them too about the same thing and they stoned Stephen. That's in, in, in the book of, of Acts. You can read, read that in, 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 in that passage with the stone of Stephen. And note significantly that when Stephen was stoned, they dropped his garments at the feet of the young man, Saul. That is significant for significant. That dropping now is an indication of that same person who persecuted the Christians that is now going to become the main person who is going to take the gospel now to the Gentiles. Because the Jews have now severed themselves from the covenant. And, and Jesus, in the parable, you see all these things are coming together and tying up. Jesus says he's taking it from them and giving it to one meat that will bear fruit. It is now going to go to the Gentiles. He came his own and his own receiving not. And Saul is going to be the main person that would, that would carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And they, at the ending of that last period, now they are crucifying Stephen. He preached to them and, and, and told them, now you have a chance to, to get reconciled. They stoned Stephen. That's the complete end of that last three and a half years. And now the, the gospel is going to go to Gentiles. And the, the, the prophecy of Daniel, Jesus also makes the connection and told them that the city... At the temple. Remember, 70 weeks have been determined for your people and the and the and the temple, the holy city and the people. And at the end of this all, a prince shall come, which will bring destruction on the temple and Jerusalem. Jesus told them about it in his prophecy. That's what Matthew chapter 24, Luke 13, and sorry, Mark 13 and Luke 21 was prophesying. And that's why Jesus made the connection between that time and what Daniel said. It all ties in to that 490 years. And you can't separate the week from that because the week is bound up in that. 
said, cut off, I have three and a half years. Another three and a half they had to repaint and still refused to do it. And the city is going to get, get destroyed in 1870. And so it means that the Messiah would have had to come before the temple was destroyed because that was part of the prophecy of the 490 years. And it was fulfilled exactly as Daniel was given by Angel Gabriel. Now, so that's a lot to chew. But I hope I have helped you to, to understand it. And that, that you have grasped the, the meaning of it. Let me throw the question to you before you respond. Was, was Jesus born in AD or in BC? Was he born in 1 BC or 1 AD? You now we're trying to connect to, to Jesus' birth because the Messiah coming could also mean the birth of Jesus from what the Gabriel said. So I throw that question up to you so you can, you can give me that answer while you are perhaps reflecting on what I said or some other things. So I'm open now. If you don't get in all your questions tonight, you can get you can write some of them down as you go back to it and you reflect. And I can answer some of them before we go on to look at um, the millennial kingdom. How that applies um, to future prophecies and to the end time events. All right, so I will still give you some time to download because I took some time to explain it to you. So if you can't get all your questions or your comments now, I will give um, a, at least a little 15 minute session so that you can dialogue with me. But can anybody give me the answer to when Jesus was born in B BC or AD? 1, 1 BC or 1 AD? Or do you have a different time? Do you understand what I just explained in that? 490 weeks of years, 490 years. Um, Rev? Yes. Adrian and Nikisha, they're saying, I'm not understanding verse 24. I am hearing you say four, 490 years, but 70 weeks cannot be 490 years. Please explain. And then Pastor John has either a comment or question as well after you respond to this from the chat. Yeah. 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 Yes, there are there are weeks of years, Sister um, Nikisha. There are weeks of years because prophetically, um, while they are are listed as weeks, prophetically, there, there will be years because all of these things could not have been fulfilled in seventy weeks. Not 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 what the angel is telling Gabriel here that the walls and the city have to be rebuilt. The Messiah has to come, and all these things have to happen. He's going to be cut off. That, that cannot be 70 weeks. So it's really 70, it's 490 years. Seven multiplied by seven, 70 weeks multiplied by seven. There are weeks of years. So each week will be represented a year and 70 weeks of years be 70 multiplied by seven will give you 490 years. So that's the duration of the period that has been cut out or has been determined for all of these things to be fulfilled in, in the life of Jews and in relation to the Messiah. That's the self, that's that's four hundred ninety. Seven seven are forty nine four hundred ninety. Uh, Pastor John, you can go ahead. What well, yes, that sir. answers? Yes, Reverend Jackman. Yes, yes, sir. To notice in the same passage with Stephen. Yes. Is that there are two witnesses that Stephen is beholding the spiritual realm, looking down on all that is transparent. Yes. Stephen looks up and he sees the stand at the right hand of God. That's right. He was able to look from the physical realm into the spiritual realm and see Jesus and God, but by, by the same token, they were able to look into the, 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 the physical realm and see the fulfillment of the prophecy being portrayed. Yes. Yes. That's right. And he and he was now looking at the most holy place. Because remember, the, Daniel talked about the most holy place. Some people say the most holy. Um, and and that's the that's the most holy place now, because Jesus now is, is at the right hand of the Father, ascended into the most holy place.
I, I believe we have some. That's Fabian. That, that's you, Fabian. It is. <laughs> Hi there. Yes, so, Fabian. Yes, I was here. You had read not over that 490 years comment uh, earlier, and I just remembered this pa passage. Yes. Uh, Matthew 1, verse 17. Mm -hmm. So the whole number of generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. Mm -hmm. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So is this a suggestion? I mean, if mm -hmm. we follow the original concept of three, three score and 10, this 490 years concept seems, seems to be repeating itself throughout the Bible. Okay. Your comment. Yes. That, that 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 is an interesting perception. I I never analyze it in in that in that way, but but that that is also a um a, a good way that you can you can look at that. See, because there there are, there are patterns as they say in the Bible, but a lot of things sometimes we don't see the pattern until we we study them closely. Like I can show you the the, the, um, the significance there with um the 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 more rare experience with Abraham and Isaac. And, and, and Jesus, and, and, if, and if you also look at this this whole thing here with, with Daniel, Daniel's weeks, and uh, you remember, in, in terms of the timeline, the Bible says in Matthew, wise men came from the east. Now, now, Persia is to the east of Jerusalem, and and the wise men were historically supposed to have been from Persia. Remember where Daniel was when he got this this revelation? He was in Persia. He was now under the rest and Cyrus rule because the, the as as the prophecy showed the the Media Persian Empire overtook the Babylonian Empire. So Daniel served under Nebuchadnezzar, but he's also serving under Cyrus because Cyrus is the one who would have given the decree. And the wise men would have come from Persia. Now, obviously, Daniel, who was made the head of the wise men, because remember that was that was the elevation he got because of the interpretation of the dream. He he was he was elevated to the, the, the head of the of the wise men. And and chances are that those those wise men would have received that same revelation from Daniel's um word of these 70 weeks, and they calculated that's why he was asking about the coming of the Messiah. They calculated the coming of the Messiah based on that time reference, that timeline given here in Daniel, you know, because the Persians. Those, those white men would have heard from what Daniel said. And when they came to Jerusalem looking for Jesus, when they came to Bethlehem, sorry, looking for Jesus, it was about that time, around the time of Jesus' birth. Now, tradition says that the white men were in the stable, but that's not correct. Because if you read Matthew, it says that the white men went to the house looking for, for where Jesus was. When they came to the house, where Jesus was. Jesus was about two years then when the wise men did get because they had to travel a good distance to get there. See? But that is a connection between the birth of Jesus and the wise men coming and where they came from and how they got to know the timeline that the Jews miss. Shepherds got the news and told them and they didn't even care. And here are pagan men because they were pagans coming to look for their Messiah that was given to them to end the transgression and they missed their visitation. That's what Jesus told them in Luke 19. You missed the visitation. So there's a lot of connections in the world. When you begin to see how it fits together, it is amazing. And it sometimes blows your mind how connected the Bible is with all of these different writers over hundreds of years and the harmony that there is in it. It's really indeed remarkable. And it's a sure sign of, of God's presence in all of it. So thank you for that, Fabian. So um, I see Randy has a, um, his hand up, but then following up from that, I think right there suggesting that it could very well be that he was born in 3 BC and persons may have assumed based on the timing that the wise men came that that would have been mm -hmm. the official birth. And that's what, what they cut as one? Yeah, you, you move from one, you move from one AD, so I want BC to one AD. There's no zero. I remember, remember how you have to work it out. I'll I, I let you calculate and then you can come out and give me. If you can check when 
Herod died. All right? Check for when Herod died. I remember that Jesus was about two years old when Herod died. Because mm -hmm. Herod was killing all the baby boys two years and down to try to get rid of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he got sent into Egypt to escape that. And then he came back after Herod died. So, now check. Check when Herod died. I remember that Jesus was two years old and that would have given you a time of of what 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 period of time Jesus was actually born because that's where people make mistakes and, and they give the age of Jesus and his crucifixion incorrectly because they do not calculate the time that Jesus would have been born correctly because they miss that part. So to so answer the question I asked you, Jesus was born in BC. He was not born in AD. He was born in BC. But AD started in reference to Jesus' presence, but he was not born in AD. Right? You check and see if you can tell me what, what time you think he would have been born according to your um, research. All right? Jeff, you had a question? No, I think Randy has something to say. No, I, Randy. I, I, you just answered it because I was just going to reverse the question and I asked you when the AD began. Ask me. When the AD began. So you know, you know, you know answer. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. So 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 get a little information there. I remember there's no zero. You go from four, but I I, I almost gave give away the answer there. You check and see if you can get a connection then to the actual time period that Jesus was been born in BC. But that's where he was born. He was not born in AD. People make that mistake. The timeline start from 1 AD in relation to in the year of our Lord, but that's after you change over from the BC. But Jesus was not born in AD. And remember, there's no zero. So you move from 1 BC, then the next year would have been 1 AD. So any any comments, comments or questions on Daniel? That means that you understand it. Or you have not thought it true as as um in the depth, but remember, I'm going to give you um some time next week. So you can put your questions down or your comments, and I will give you some time next week because as I said, it's a heavy passage. But I, I hope that I've tried to simplify it for you that you understand what's connected to. I saw the parallel with Jeremiah and why the prayer was being made, why the punishment was given, because they rejected the Sabbath. And God was not allowing the land to rest for those 70 years while they were down in punishment in Babylon. At the end of it, he promised he would bring them up exactly as, as he did. Check Isaiah 44 and 45. You will see that Isaiah told you that Cyrus was going to give the decree to release the Jews to go back. That is prophesied too in the Bible by Isaiah. And it actually happened. So the, the Bible is a, is a powerful book. Like I said, I get excited when I read these things. And make the connection. So, if if there are no more questions, then I could um, say we will close off for tonight. Just, Rev, just, um, yes, yeah. yeah just before you close, Randy is in again. The, yes, the, Randy. The prayers that God, they, yes, they were supposed to rest the land. How how do some of these principles apply to us today? How would some of these principles apply to us in terms of land and work ethics? How would they apply? Well, the, the, well, the people who study agriculture indicate that that principle is definitely for the good of the land. Remember, God made everything and God has things on his control. You leave the land to follow. When you leave the land to follow, it replenishes itself and the nutrients that the plants have taken out are replenished that the crops then can grow better. If you keep growing the same crop on the same land over and over and over again, the yields are decreased because you're using up all the nutrients. So it was it was a it was an agricultural thing, but it was good. So people still adopt it today. They might not leave the land fallow for seven years as God had decreed to those because remember seven was significant for for, for, for that tradition. So that's why maybe the, the seven years will be will be given. At the end of the seven sevens, you had a jubilee. 
right? By the 50th year, because seven sevens are bringing the 49. On the 50th year, well, that was the Jubilee. That was a big celebration where people get a chance to go back. People who were slaves get their freedom and a whole lot of things were, were under the Jubilee. So if we abide by God's principles, circumcision was a was, was divine ordained and, and there are good health benefits to that. There's there, there are good agricultural purposes to the following of the land and, and resting. Um, you know, so these are things that are, are practically because are practically applicable because Jesus, because God is, is the designer of these things. So they have their place, definitely. All right, it's still after, so if there are no more questions, then we would call for tonight. Thank you again for being here and those of you who engage, and I'm looking forward for more dialogue with you. You check through um, Daniel chapter 9 and you read the Old Testament passages again, because as I said, we will talk about them when we come to looking at the millennium. And you could formulate some questions or some comments based on those um, as well. And if you have any comments on the passages that we looked at from the New Testament in relation to the, the present reality of the kingdom, I will also entertain some questions on, on those before we pick up our study of the millennium. So you can read Revelation chapter 20. Make sure you study that because we are going to be engaged in, in that as our main um, study session for next week. So thank you very much. God bless you. Have a good night and looking forward to our discussion and our study next week, God willing.